Hello, good afternoon. It's uh, two o'clock and we will start with a webinar. Uh, thank you for your presence today. And this webinar is about business opportunities in Lusophone, Africa. My name is Nuria Fuan Cunha Suarez, and I'll be today's moderator during this webinar. Uh, within NABC, uh, I'm the head of the Community and Events and the Africa Insights Desk. And I'm also the cultural representative for Angola, Mozambique, and uh, Senegal. Uh, for those who are not, don't know NABC very well or are not familiar with our work or the things that we do, uh, last year we commemorated our 75th year birthday anniversary. Uh, we are a membership organization with around 250 Dutch members uh, as uh, companies as a members. And since uh, this year also, uh, some uh, African members, uh, companies have joined as a member. Uh, we have members from big ones, from multinationals, uh, uh, as strategic partners like Heineken, uh, Sonex, Invest International, um, and SGS. But also we have a lot of uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, micro members, and startups. And we have a very extensive um, network in Africa and in uh, and in Europe, more than 10,000 business leads, uh, for instance, agricultural councils, embassies, uh, trade organizations, but also suppliers uh, everywhere uh, in Africa. And in the Netherlands, we are the leading network organization for trade and investment facilitation for Africa. So uh, in a nutshell, our aim is to link Dutch companies uh, with African companies that they can work together as a private sector, they can benefit from the developments, the developments happening in the African continent. And uh, we hope for them also to, to play a crucial role in driving uh, Africa's growth in a sustainable and very important inclusive manner. Uh, we touch several, uh, several sectors, uh, but we do have a focus, for instance, in poultry and livestock and dairy, horticulture, agri-trading and agri-machinery, among others. Uh, the services that we provide uh, vary. Varies. Uh, we have the community and events, the events that we uh, developed for, organized for our members, but also uh, trade missions, incoming missions uh, to the Netherlands and outgoing missions to several uh, African countries. Uh, we have the African Insights Desk uh, with the uh, uh, assignments for, uh, for the members and uh, a variety of, uh, of services that we, can, uh, that we offer. One of the things that we experience uh, is that there is a lot of focus, uh, not only for our members, but just in general, uh, and some interest on the Anglophone and Francophone Africa. And with this webinar, we really would like to put uh, more attention on the opportunities that exist in the Portuguese speaking African countries, uh, also known as the Países uh, Africanos de Língua Oficial Portuguesa, Palop in Portuguese. Um, and we hope also to inspire you a little bit. So in, there are six uh, Lusophone countries. Uh, but unfortunately, we cannot um, expose them all. So we, in this session, we only focus on Mozambique uh, and um, Cape Verde, Cabo Verde, and, uh, and Angola. Uh, we also hope that eventually uh, this uh, webinar can be a, a kickoff of several other um, yeah, events about this subject. Uh, and it can be also a variance of the, uh, the Francophone uh, Africa Business Forum, which already exists, we organize every two years, focusing on uh, French-speaking African countries, versus Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. And we hope eventually that we can develop uh, a lab forum, so uh, a Lusophone Africa Business, uh, Business Forum. And like I said before, yeah, we really hope to, to inspire you today. So regarding the program of today, um, right after uh, me, uh, Ms. Marisa Montaigne Borspong will follow. Uh, she's a lawyer and also the founder and president of uh, Portolandia, the Chamber of Commerce between the Netherlands 
and Portugal, and she will provide you with context on Lusophone Africa uh, in recent developments there. Uh, then Mr. Amido Toes, uh, the Senior Econ Econ Economic uh, uh, Affairs Officer of the Netherlands Embassy in Rwanda, uh, will shed some light on the policy framework of the embassy and the Dutch government, uh, and also on the key sectors in Angola. He will be followed by his colleague, uh, Ms. Uh, Annelies Mude, who will do the same, but focusing then on the Mozambique. And uh, Ms. Mude, she's the Secretary for Political and Economic Affairs of the Netherlands Embassy in Maputo. Uh, after the policy framework is provided, uh, it's up to the companies to, to share their experience. And uh, first will be Mr. Sergio Vega Monteiro, uh, who is the managing partner at uh, HSSM uh, Advogados, uh, who will provide you with information about doing business in Cabo Verde. Uh, he will be followed by uh, Jaco, Jaco Leroux, uh, with the Group Managing Director of Afi Fruta, and we'll do the same but then for Mozambique. And lastly, Mr. Alvin Leon Das, uh, who is the Co-Founder and Executive Director of Farms International. Um, he will share also his experience of uh, doing business um, in Angola. So um, I would like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Marisa Montaigne Borspo, We'll do her uh, presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nuria. And um, um, thank you all today for coming. Uh, this is a topic that is uh, very important for myself, uh, but also for the organization that I am representing today. Uh, to give a little bit of context, uh, we are still a very young organization, but um let's see if we manage to also share the screen um and start uh you are seeing my screen yes we are seeing your screen so yes. um when when i first uh, um came to the netherlands i understood that the idea of what what are the the portuguese speaking countries in the world was not a topic that was well known. I have a pure V so in the Portuguese language, so many people. So uh, myself and a Dutch amazing lady start this project that is, is the Stichting, um, a nonprofit organization, uh, to see if we could bridge uh, Portugal and the Netherlands, but also, if we could um, bridge what is uh, the Benelux and the Portuguese speaking uh, communities in the world. Um, so that is our aim. The Chamber of Commerce uh, aims to be a little bit the foot in the ground of the Portuguese uh, speaking community in the Netherlands as well. As I said differently, since we are a nonprofit organization, of entrepreneurs that share the same values, the same vision, and uh, we are in the ground, so we also understand uh, sometimes better the difficulties of the daily um, life in, in business and in, in commerce and trade primarily. So uh, with this uh, uh, in, in, uh, as a vision, we started um, three years ago, and we thought that it was time for new routes, new horizons, new partnerships, and new perspectives. Um, we share, um, as Nuria was presenting, um, we share a lot of what uh, NABC has uh, also as targets, uh, of course. And of course, uh, energy, uh, the maritime sector, uh, agriculture, and technology, um, are uh, highly important, uh, but uh, also other uh, areas. Uh, I remind, of course, the, the importance of the port of Rotterdam being the second uh, biggest uh, uh, port in the world, and the importance of the port of Sinus, um, or growing importance um, in, in after the change of the Panama uh, route canals. Uh, so with that in mind, also, 
this idea of the, the new horizons uh, present you with um, a larger uh, Portuguese speaking um, uh, map. And as you can see here, these are the official Portuguese speaking countries in the world. But there is an area, the, the, or there's an organization also called CPLP that has uh, also what is the area of influence of the Portuguese speaking language that still has strong bonds with uh, India and also, uh, of course, being an official language in Macau that was Portuguese territory till 2000. So it is quite uh, interesting in a sense that this language um, is so spread and with that facilitating the communication of, of so many. Um, for us, it was key to follow uh, a new module of cooperation that um, we could uh, encapsulate the quadruple helix approach. Uh, so we do try to also understand the governance uh, uh, element uh, with business and of course the academic research uh, more and more important as we go. And um, that is an asset on itself. And of course the civil society organizations that play such an important role as we want to uh, believe that the, the Portolandia is uh, being also a nonprofit organization um, and being part of a chamber of 60 chambers of commerce, Portuguese chambers of commerce in the world, recognized by the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Portugal. So this importance of this uh, smaller structures that can um, act as an aggregator uh, of uh, bigger and more um, substantiated um, organizations also uh, longer in the field with much uh, many years and members, of course. Uh, and that takes us exactly to also the new perspectives, uh, new generations that uh, immigrate to, to, to the Netherlands, but also um, new generations that are more globalized, that understand also the power of doing business in, in, in uh, the digital sphere, where language also uh, plays an important role. Um, and of course, um, even nowadays, the possibility of easily uh, uh, do what many wish, for example, of uh, remote working where Portuguese, uh, Portugal was now uh, nominated one of the best countries in Europe to do so. But for example, following the lead of Cape Verde, that is an agile, fantastic country uh, with high ambition also in the digital sphere. So this, this power of aggregating and um, adding value to, to others is very, very important in the digital era. Um, so with that in mind, we also follow, we are aligned as NABC with sustainable goals. We do believe in the cooperation to fulfill the goals itself. So the goal, the sustainable goal 17, and we are aligned fully with uh, the impact economy, with the sustainability of uh, this, this new era. So with that, our partnerships align to uh, provide better solutions uh, to the new challenges ahead. Um, the idea is, as I said, to reinforce the relationship between these two countries, but with the, their own spheres, uh, with the Portuguese speaking community, and also, the, of course, the, the Benelux and uh, other countries uh, that speak Dutch. Um, and of course, uh, we will need to, to find um, creative solutions uh, and resilient capacity for the challenge ahead, especially in a post pandemic. Uh, scenario. As, as we were, uh, as I was mentioning, also innovation is an important trait that we believe that with smaller and agile um, players working together with others, we can have uh, better solutions, hopefully. And we are a, a multidisciplinary team. Uh, also multicultural and I would say even multi-generational uh, 
um, which brings us uh, so many um, ad or a true added value in creating uh, tailor-made solutions for the ones that can uh, benefit from our work. We have a program that we launch with Invoice, so with special uh, people in spe specific uh, fields. And um, we will, uh, of course, follow this program ahead. So you are more than welcome to reach us um, for this. Um, since today was, uh, our goal is literally to support this um, uh, awareness of the, what is the lusophonia, is how we say it in Portuguese. So the, the Portuguese speaking countries in the world. Um, our mission is completed. We hope that we are also uh, ready for the Q&A, but the most important thing is also to hear the people that will bring us from the field, the opportunities of the countries that it represents. And so please feel free to uh, contact, but, and we are ready to cooperate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marisa, for uh, the very interesting presentation about uh, yeah, the Chamber of Commerce and what you can do and what you actually also can mean uh, to the to potential uh, companies who want to do business in, in Lusophone Africa. Thank you very much. Just uh, a quick remark I forgot to, to mention. Um, so after the presentation, there'll be 20 minutes of Q&A but feel already free to, yeah, in the meantime, to insert your questions in the Q&A so that we can discuss them later on um, after the last presentation. So uh, we will continue with the next presentation of Mr. Uh, Armin Lukteuns, who is a Senior Economic Affairs Officer of the Netherlands Embassy in Luanda. Armin, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Nuria, and uh, also for the opportunity to present uh, from uh, the perspective of the embassy, the business opportunities, I think is very welcoming. It's an initiative to, to, to connect with the Lusophone countries in the region and to see where we can find synergies. This being said, uh, let me just first introduce myself. My name is Armin Duterns. I'm, this, like Nuria mentioned, the senior economic advisor at uh, the Emb Netherlands Embassy in Luanda, Angola. The embassy, the, Net, the Dutch embassy here in Angola is a, a rather small one, uh, trade oriented. Uh, we have two diplomats and two local policy officers, which yours truly is one. Um, from the Dutch perspective of policy is uh, on economic terms is um, concentrated on four top, top sectors, being agro-logistics, um, the water sector, oil of gas naturally, but also entrepreneurship the, due to the demographic figures uh, with the, a huge population uh, of youth. Uh, so this is actually where we're focusing. If I allow, allow, I don't know everybody who's aware of, of Angola, I'm just going to quickly give a, a small overview of the market. Uh, so Angola is a lower middle income, income country. Uh, gross domestic product is $1 billion, population of 32 million, and per capita income of $3,100. It's also ranked as the eighth largest economy in Sub-Saharan Africa. Angola is also a major oil producing country, OPEC member, with an, OPEC, uh, with an output of uh, 1.3 million uh, barrels a day, making it the second largest producer in Southern Africa. The country also holds um, significant proven gas reserves as also uh, extensive mineral resources. Angola depends largely on the offshore petroleum industry, 50% of its GDP, 65% of its budget revenues, and 97% of exports. So Angola export to the Netherlands, just to be aware of what we're doing in terms of trade between Angola and the Netherlands at this moment. Uh, mostly uh, from the Angola to the, Netherlands, to the Netherlands, it goes petroleum with mother shipments of machines, and the total um, imports was around $132 million. Dutch exports to Angola, uh, in 2019 was $179 million. Given that the country stated focus on diversifying its economy and building domestic production capacity, we believe that short and medium term potential for Dutch companies uh, exist in agriculture, industry, mineral exploration, and key infrastructure such as energy, water, and transportation logistics. But I found it also interesting to, put, to present to you today what are the, the, the economic priority sectors from an Angolan point of view. So the Angolans deem it the priority to develop the agriculture and agro industry, industry, so foodstuff, logistics, 
uh, energy and more uh, renewable energy. Angola has a high potential for solar energy. Also, what I think very, is very interesting and what is a trending in, in Europe uh, ever more, the hydrogen possibilities. We see it also in South Africa and Namibia, but also Angola has a high potential for future energy sourcing. Mm -hmm. uh, oil and gas, naturally. Uh, water sector, and this can be very broad. It can be from water uh, supply management, uh, sanitation. Uh, mineral resources. Angola has a high uh, reserves of one of the largest, actually, in worldwide, of uh, uh, gra granite and marble with a high quality. Um, education, like I mentioned before, uh, like in many countries in Africa, and Angola is not the exemption on the rule, uh, more or less 60 to 70 percent of your population is considered youth, uh, with uh, the unemployment figures. So education, technical and vocational training, higher education, scientific research, innovation, ever more is very important. Uh, with regards to construction, public works, telecommunication, and infrastructure, sure. Angola is also having large investment portfolios with, with, in this sector. I think one of the untapped markets in Angola, which also has a high potential, is also the hospitality, tourism, and leisure. Um, so next slide, please. I think it's also uh, very important to just to quickly uh, address why would, sh would we consider Angola for Dutch, ex Dutch expansion. So Angola, like I said before, is a represents a large mar market, 30, uh, 32 million uh, population, 64, uh, 61 million billion uh, in, in terms of, 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 of GDP. Despite the current economic downturn, unfortunately, we're on the sixth year in recession. Hopefully, next year or this year, even we're going to have some economic growth. Angola is still the eighth largest economy in Southern Africa, so it can be a logical next stop for for Dutch markets, uh, Dutch companies active in the in the region. Angola imports most products due to its very low capacity to produce locally. While an effort is underway to build domestic production capacities, it will require many years and depend on international supplies of key inputs for infrastructure, manufacturing and agriculture development, so driving in, uh, demand for imports. Um, also not, uh, uh, not uh, unimportant to mention is that Angolan government and industry leaders exhibit strong interest in the Netherlands. Uh, they are ever more trying to go away from this uh, leadership from, Ang from Chinese investment, so they are looking to European partners with proven return on investment. So Angolan private companies are eager to engage directly with Dutch companies, gain exposure to Dutch equipment, technologies and solutions for the economy priority sectors. Also very important is that Angola lacks conflict, it has a strong central government, so it continues to benefit from a relatively stable and predictable political environment. I think for all business people in this, uh, in, in this uh, forum, I think it's important that we also have a stable political situation in the country. So also, since we have a new uh, president after 38 years of, of uh, José de los Santos, the government of Angola has taken steps to engage in economic reform, including privatization of the state-owned enterprises and prioritizing efforts to combat corruption and increasing engagement with the Dutch government and private sector on commercial issues. So also the time is short, but I still also want to address quickly some market entry points, uh, things to be aware. So maybe the, 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 um, the next slide can also be uh, there. So I think in terms of business environment, despite it's a, a large market and the potential business opportunities are there, Angola is still deemed one of the most difficult environments in the world, business environments in the world. To be successful, significant uh, time commitments and capital are required. So a strong, experienced local partner from our point of view is highly advisable. I think one of the benefits of this forum here is the, the, the binding factor, the Portuguese language. I think uh, people who are already trying to go to mar Lucifer markets can really have a, a competitive advantage uh, by the language. Uh, the Angolan government officials and most uh, executives here outside of the oil industry require some Portuguese English interpretation for meetings, but product uh, labeling, marketing material, and most technical uh, level training must also be in Portuguese. So Dutch companies can take advantage if they have already read, written marketing, technical material, and training expertise from operations in other Portuguese language countries, such as Portugal, Mozambique, and Cape Verde countries that we are addressing today, um, to, in, to, to assist in their Ang Angola market entry efforts. Uh, however, this being said, distributors from other Portuguese or Spanish-speaking countries even would not be effective as representative for the Angola market because the experience shows us that uh, um, local market expertise and in-country product service is really really essential to, to guarantee success in the Angolan market. Also in terms of distribution, 
Angolan business infrastructure and capacity is just 19 years post civil war. So which means that only a limited number of local companies are well positioned to become your distributor or, or, or representative for your company or products. So many international products are sold through resale channels than formal representatives or distributors. So there's a solid growing entrepreneurial business class in Angola, but the current economic downturn is severely stressing Angolan companies are limiting their access to business credit. So generalizing from our point of view, the best strategy to enter the market is visiting the country. First of all, getting to know the country, importance of relationships to find a good partner and or agent. Angola offers uh, long-term business opportunities for those companies and top prospect sectors, especially for those with established experience in doing business in Africa with emphasis in low phone countries. Given its challenging business environment and the constant attention needed to develop a market presence, once again, companies should consider the necessary time commitment to, to, require, to, to guarantee success in Angola. Uh, larger international companies often they establish independent operations su subject to Angolan regulations, of course, for investing in the country. Uh, also, not, not un unimportant and to mention that uh, with this respect, current investment law, which was passed in 2018, elim eliminates the requirement for Angolan citizens to be participate in any foreign private investment in Angola. Further, also, the, the Angolan law provides uh, several tax incentives to companies investing in Angola. But in all cases, companies should always perform a thorough due diligence on potential business partners and structure contractual, contractual arrangements conforming to the Dutch and Angolan law. So I think what can we do as an MBC also seeing the time? Uh, I have a, a short slide. Of course, we can promote Dutch products and services in the Angolan market. We can assist Dutch companies in understanding the market opportunities. We can assist Dutch companies to identify qualified Angolan business partners being the bridge. We can also assist Dutch companies to understand the business environment. Uh, I think also one thing I, I forgot to mention in, in the why consider Angola. Also, we have to consider that Angola is, uh, has three deep sea ports, has a very geostrategic strategic location, which can be very advantage for investments in the region making the country also a sort of gateway, same as the function that Rotterdam has for Europe. Angola has the potential with huge markets in the region like Congo, also with highly dense populations, with low productive and also depending on import. Angola can also be a sort of gateway uh, for uh, Dutch investment in the region. So um, considering the time, naturally also we are always available. The doors are always open digitally, also here at the embassy. Our contact details are there, and I think uh, through NB NBC or through our website and also other social media, we are always available to, to address any questions now during the Q&A or uh, another time frame. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Armindo. Also very interesting uh, presentation, and when I really like you said, yeah, you uh, expressed and highlighted what are the, 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 the benefits of investing in Angola, but also which or which are the key sectors for uh, for yeah for the for the Dutch comp uh, companies uh, yeah to invest in and they should look with tourism and leisure uh, very good you mentioned the hydrogen because this is a very uh, hot topic at the moment uh, renewable energies so thank you very much I'm very also uh, eager to see the questions later on from the yeah from the participants. Uh, we will continue with the next presentation, which is from uh, Ms. Uh, Annelies Mude, um, who is the Secretary for Political and Economic Affairs at the Netherlands Embassy in Maputo. And let me see if I can share my screen. Yes, Ms. Annelies Mude, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nuria, and uh, thank you, NBC, for organizing this interesting webinar. Um, as you already explained, Nuria, my name is uh, Annelies Mude. I'm the Second Secretary for Political and Economic Affairs at the Netherlands Embassy in Maputo, Mozambique. Um, together with my colleague Sonia Mendes, 
I am responsible for economic and trade related issues uh, here at the embassy. And Sonia is also present today. She will share, or I think she already did her share her contact details in the chat. So in case you have any specific questions, you can ask her in the chat. The same um, structure that my colleague in Angola also had for his presentation. Um, I would like to cover three topics the current economic situation in Mozambique, uh, the priorities of the Netherlands in Mozambique, uh, and what the embassy can do for that, that do or would like to do business in Mozambique. Um, although Mozambique is one of the poorest countries in the world, um, economically, it's also one of the most promising countries. Um, especially the discovery of major gas fields uh, that took place in 2010 made the economic forecast reach over, I think, 8% annually by 2017. Um, however, I feel also would like to address the perhaps less appealing developments over the last couple of years, uh, especially now my colleague in Angola stressed the importance for stability um, and the, the absence of any conflict in Angola. Um, in Mozambique, unfortunately, we had three major developments that caused a setback uh, on the way to economic prosperity. I do not include the COVID pandemic since I think that's something that affected almost all countries in the world. Uh, but um, for Mozambique, firstly, we had a hidden debt scandal in 2016 uh, that caused um, a major financial and economic crisis. The trial that results from this scandal is currently ongoing. So we'll see, we'll have to see what comes from that. Secondly, um, the cyclones Idai and Kenneth uh, that hit the country hard in 2019. Uh, I think there are examples of how climate change is affecting and, and also will be affecting the country of Mozambique in the future. Um, and lastly, the conflict in the northern province of Cabo Delgado, about which I think you have probably heard. Um, insurgency groups started to carry out attacks from 2017 on, including the major attack on the city of Palma um, and the capture of the city of Mosimbara Praia. Uh, due to these attacks, the energy company, the, or the largest energy company, uh, Total, had to declare force majeure uh, concerning its massive natural gas investments in Cabo Delgado, and that uh, called a halt to major international investments. The force majeure is still in place, but um, the security situation has improved after the arrival of international troops of Rwanda and the Southern African Development Company um, last year, uh, and they are still present in Mozambique. It's still unclear when the gas exploration will be able to continue, but there are some optimistic signs at the moment. Um, however, it's very important to stress um, that it's crucial that root causes of this conflict are dealt with. And the more than, I think, over 800,000 IDPs, the, they should be supported in a safe return to their home territories. The Mozambican government is taking some steps in that direction, but um, they will need the help from international donors and also the private sector. Now, this all might sound a bit alarming, and that's not my intention to scare you away, because I think it's very clear that there are many business opportun opportunities in Mozambique and not only in the north where the most, most of the gas reserves are discovered, but also in other geographical areas. In my opinion, the most promising sectors are energy, of course, um, agriculture, the maritime sector, logistics, and also water and tourism. Um, looking at these sectors, I think Mozambique has also a great potential for exports. It has a coastline of 2,500 kilometers. So that's uh, quite, a, quite a long coastline. Um, I, as my colleague in Angola already said, of course, it's also very important to speak Portuguese and it can be a, a huge advantage if you already have any material, promotion material, marketing material in Portuguese. Um, yeah, I think those are the most important things I wanted to say about the current situation in Mozambique. Um, and then for the next slide, um, about the priorities of the Netherlands in Mozambique. The Netherlands has supported the development of Mozambique since the 1970s. So in a few years, we will have a 50 year anniversary of development cooperation. And development cooperation is still the main priority of the embassy. Um, we as an embassy are currently in the uh, process of writing a new country strategy for the period 2023-2026. So 
So unfortunately, I cannot tell you with much certainty what our priorities for the next years will be, but I can reflect on what we're currently doing. We, as the Netherlands, have two geographical focus areas in Mozambique. The first one is the northern province of Cabo Gado. The second one is the Zambezi Valley in the center of the country, and that also includes the, the, the Bayra Corridor. Um, we have three thematic fo focus areas, um, sexual reproductive health and rights, food nutrition uh, and security, and the third one is water. And our main activities are within these sectors, but beside these sectors, we also have projects on entrepreneurship. You might have heard about the Orange Corners program, a very big program that the Netherlands runs in multiple countries in this world. Uh, and I think Orange Corners Mozambique was one of the first ones. Uh, besides entrepreneurship, we have activities on gender, uh, good governance of society and, and human rights. Um, and the last slide is about what the Netherlands can do for Dutch companies in Mozambique. Due to the deteriorating business climate, the embassy decided in 2020, at the beginning of 2021, uh, that we will shift our focus from trade promotion to local private sector and development. Nevertheless, we are still ready to support Dutch companies that want to do business in Mozambique and we encourage companies in Mozambique to contact us. Same, uh, what our, my colleague in Angola already explained, the same goes for, for our embassy. Of course, you can come to us with specific trade requests. Uh, we have an extensive network that we are very happy to share with you in case you're looking for contacts with the government, other embassies, public or private institutions, companies to partner with, NGOs, and much more. Uh, you can also just register, register your company uh, with us to make sure we can connect you in case any interesting parties or uh, initiatives come up, uh, then we will con contact you, of course, um, and we do organize various events. Now it's also possible again due, due to the uh, COVID situation that's a bit better than last year. So we are planning to organize networking drinks and different lectures and webinars. Um, and we also inform companies about responsible, bis responsible business conduct. And of course, we keep uh, those companies posted on any interesting initiative that might come up. Um, lastly, and then I will finish my presentation uh, when I look at the time, that's also about time to do so. Um, you find the contact details of me and my colleague Sonia uh, on the bottom of the slide. I also included the contact details of Sinara Sotomayor. She is the focal point for Mozambique uh, at the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. They also do a lot um, in terms of supporting Dutch businesses in Mozambique. And they have many instruments um, for that purpose about knowledge and information and networks and contacts, but also for promotion and for financing. So don't hesitate to reach out to us or to Sinara if you'd like to know more about that. That was the end of my presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Annelise. Uh, also very interesting. Um, yeah, at the start of the presentation, you uh, were, were very honest about all the challenges that Mozambique is experiencing at this moment, which I really like because um, it's good for the investor um, or potential investor to have that in mind that, um, yeah, these are actually challenged and it's not always easy, but uh, you're also able to, to, uh, to get more um, information about the opportunities. So Mozambique did suffer the last years from a couple of setbacks, but in the end, it needs to be rebuilt and there lies opportunity for, uh, for the private sector to, uh, to tap in. So you, you mentioned the maritime sector, the energy, especially renewable energies, food security. So all, these are all things that the private sector, both in Mozambique or in the Netherlands, could contribute to. Uh, for this development. So thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we will continue with the next presentation. Uh, let me see. Yeah, and that will be from Sergio Vega Monteiro. Uh, so we now uh, have understood a little bit of, about what is Portuguese speaking Africa and the context um, of, of those countries but also what is the, uh, the, the, the policy framework uh, which is being applied at the moment. And now it's time 
to hear the entrepreneurs, the, yeah, the business people uh, active in uh, Cabo Verde, in Mozambique, and in Angola. And we'll start uh, with uh, Mr. Sergio Vega Monteiro, who is a managing partner at HSSM Advogados. Sergio, the floor is yours. We can't hear you, Sergio. We still can't hear you. Is there something with your mic, perhaps, because you're not muted anymore? No, can't hear you. Just a moment. Let me see if we can. Uh... Now, uh, in the meantime, uh, we're trying to solve this problem. We'll continue then with Mr. Uh, Jaco Le Houx. Uh, he's a group managing director of Afri Fruta. And Jaco? Yeah. He's yeah, he's based in Mozambique, and uh, he will uh, share his experience from doing business in Mozambique. Uh, good afternoon, Nuria. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody participating. Um, yeah, my name is Jaco Leroux. I'm the Group Managing Director of Afri Fruta. Uh, we're based in Mozambique. Um, I've been doing business and living in Mozambique for more than 10 years now. Uh, We've got the, we in the agricultural processing industry. Um, we also in the importing exporting part. We import from South Africa uh, to Mozambique. Uh, just, this is just a little bit of history of us. We've got a sales office in the Netherlands in South Africa. We started the company in 2016. Uh, our current square uh, coverage is about 1,500 square meters where we do uh, fruit and vegetables. Well, food processing and coconut oil uh, production. Um, just uh, we've got five dryers, uh, three cold rooms. We have our own uh, logistics system. And with the agricultural part, we introducing new cultivars uh, in, in, to the communities where we are uh, international uh, standard products. Um, can you? Continue with this, the screen, please. Um, yeah, basically, this is my partner. We, uh, this man and running the, the Dutch uh, marketing office uh, in uh, Eindhoven, um, where myself on the right hand side is based in, in Yamban in Mozambique. Um, this is just a, a bit of an overview uh, of what we're doing. Um, in our areas, we use international quality um, technology. Um, we are the, the first and the biggest uh, food processing factory in Mozambique, drying uh, mangoes, pine pineapples, coconuts, bananas, um, and also doing virgin coconut oil. Uh, we procure most of our products from uh, smallholders or individual farmers. Uh, we are in the process of doing a bit of our own agricultural production, but the majority of the stuff is being uh, procured uh, from the local communities in our areas. 95% uh, of our products are being exported to Europe um, uh, via the Netherlands, uh, with these men doing the marketing on that side. We also do marketing in Mozambique and in South Africa. Um, yeah, this is just some pictures of, of what we're doing here. Um, doing business in, in, in Mozambique specifically is a challenge. Um, you are basically uh, a person starting up everything. There's no logistics, there's no spare parts. Um, it, it's, you're starting from scratch. Um, things take time and cost keep running up. It's important to um, do a proper analysis, uh, time and, and uh, 
budgeting wise, uh, we always joke and say pie 3.146 uh, was designed for Mozambique because you do your time analysis and your, and your budgets and then you add uh, pi to it to, to be more accurate um, because there's a lot of hidden costs that you don't know in the beginning um, and things take time. Um, there's a saying here in Mozambique that um, tomorrow is also a new day, so you don't have to do everything today. Um, so from a Western uh, economy point of view, that's a bit frustrating. So if you are an impatient person, um, you will get frustrated because things takes a bit of time to start up, things takes a bit of time to get resolved. Um, but just know doing business in a country like Mozambique and I assume that the other Franco African countries will be the same will take longer than the average uh, or the normal thing that you are used to. Um, you have to be a, a jack of all trades. Um, these challenges in, in all angles. Um, for us, there's, there's no qualified or certified <coughs> electricians or mechanics in the area where we are, so you have to be able to do things your own. Um, if a cold room or something break down, you either have to fly somebody in from South Africa or from Maputo, uh, or you have to be able to fix it yourself. The same with um, spare parts and things. That's a major challenge for us. Is you have to, to be able to estimate what you're going to need in the season and make sure you've got enough spare parts. Um, because if you don't, it takes you about two weeks to get spare parts to where you are. Um, we basically in central Mozambique, go to the southern part, but in areas further up north, it's logistics is a major challenge. So that all of those kind of things are something that you have to include in your planning, in your budget, in your business sense as well. If you don't know, um, or if you can't do that, it's going to be a challenge for you in that sense. Um, you're not just focusing on what you're doing. You have to focus on the, on the supporting side. You have to focus on the logistics side. Um, Another point, um, it's not on my screen, but that I, I really want to, to mention, there's so many opportunities in Mozambique. Um, and that's part of the challenge. You need to be able to focus and to select and to focus on, on what, you, what you decide to do because you tend to get sidetracked so easily trying to address a lot of these opportunities that's coming by and, and that dilutes your focus. And a, a lot of companies are getting in problems because, uh, because of that. So it's something that's important is to do your planning um, some of our previous speakers from the embassy have mentioned it. Do a proper due diligence with your partners, with people that you are going to work with. Um, that's a major challenge is that you start off with and then you realize that the legal aspect is not right. So you have to redo the same thing again. All the people that you have partnered with uh, have problems and, and then you have to, to get those aspects sorted out. Um, so it's important to do proper homework from the beginning and, and take a year longer and make sure everything is in place. Uh, another thing uh, that's also important is to make sure that you've got a market. Um, Mozambique is a phenomenal country. The production is enormous. But I know of so many farmers that plant it and they've got huge crops, but there's no silos or, or place to store the maize. They don't have a market. Uh, so all of those kind of things are, are important in the agricultural side, but in also other aspects. Um, ensure that you that you know what you're going to do with your products, where you're going to sell it to, um, before you, you go into an area. With agricultural specifically, I know of people that that got a piece of land and then they want to start macadamia, um, but it's completely climate-wise not the not the right area. So rather decide before what you want to do and then go and look for the area that will be suitable for the pro products that you want to do. Um, instead of vice versa, uh, because land is available, but uh, it not, doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right area to grow whatever you want to grow. Um, we are in the food industry. Food is a sensitive um, product. Um, you are time const constrained. Um, markets, um, especially in the last couple of years with the corona, it's been a major challenge exporting um, of food products because of the, the availability of ships and containers. Um, so those kind of things need a lot of education, need a lot, a lot of knowledge. Um, it's something that, that, that you will have to know in, in advance. It, it's difficult in a normal year to export, but with the current scenario that you're in, it's even more difficult. So it's all things that you have to plan and that you will have to be able to live with. Um, if you can't overbridge these challenges, um, you will not make it. So those are things to consider even before you're starting up. Uh, looking at the last point, um, the local law are sometimes different from where you come from. 
So it's important to have a proper knowledge of it. Um, don't just listen to, there's a lot of consultants on the ground um, that are fly by night. So ensure that you've got a thorough knowledge of the law. It is available in, in a couple of languages you can get from the internet or from companies. Um, so don't always just say, believe what somebody's telling you. Make sure you, that you've got a thorough grasp of, of it, um, understand the labor laws, understand the specific laws in your industry or in your business sector that you're going into, and, and ensure that it's apply. Um, because as the owner of the business, at the end of the day, it all comes back down to you. So it's no use in saying, but I didn't know or I didn't understand it or whatever. So it's important to, to have a thorough grasp of the law, of the um, in different areas and, and try to have a good, um, be very integrated with the government. So we work very closely with the, the provincial governor, uh, with the administrators, and uh, it opens up a lot of doors to have a, a good relationship with the, the, the government in your area. Obviously, um, there's some expectation from your side um, to, to, to do things um, in the communities, but it's all that, that what we as a company are there for is to uplift the community where we are. So we had to be, uh, gladly do um, what is required for us in that sense. Um, yeah, well, thank you for giving this time to share a bit. And uh, if there's any questions, I'll be available later to, you, to answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ako, for this interesting presentation. <clears throat> yeah, you were the first entrepreneur who was giving the presentation, so I think everyone was really uh, eager to hear your experience. And from what I understood, it's actually a very long haul, but it's worth. So from your experience, you're saying that you have to understand the sourcing side of the business, in this case, uh, mangoes, uh, but you also have to understand that the market side. So that encompasses the whole value chain. You have to understand how it functions. And it's also good to, to, to have good connections and to, uh, to work together actually with, uh, with the government, specifically the, the local authorities. So yeah, it gave us a glimpse on the, how to do business in, uh, in Mozambique. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we will now continue with the previous speaker. So I hope uh, Hi, Nuria, I think it's working now. Can yeah, you it's now working, Sergio. Yeah, okay. we can hear you. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Very so good. First of, <laughs> first of all, uh, I want to thank N NABC for the opportunity to share the information about the business environment in, in Cabo Verde. And I also, uh, <clears throat> I was enjoying and I'm looking forward to also to learn more about the business environment in other uh, Lusophone uh, countries. And I hope uh, uh, it will raise uh, interest to the country and the, uh, to my country and the Lusophone countries in general. <clears throat> so uh, a quick introduction. So my name is Sergio Monteiro. I'm a lawyer and I'm managing partner of HSSM Law Firm. Uh, we have a, a, a extensive experience in supporting companies from uh, several different industries and also uh, foreign investors since our economy is uh, uh, mainly based uh, on, on foreign investment. Uh, I'll share now my, my presentation. Just a yes, moment, please. Great. Yeah, oh, okay. Okay, are you seeing my screen? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'll start uh, by providing a quick uh, information about the country. So Cabo Verde is located 500 kilometers from the west coast of Africa. Is um, There are 10 islands, only nine are, are in, in Arde. Uh, the land area is around 4,000 square meters. The population is uh, around 540,000 uh, with an average age of 28.3 years old. So we are very young population. Uh, the literary index is approximately uh, 95%. The official language is Portuguese. The maternal language is Cape Verdean Creole. Uh, the currency is Cape Verdean Scudos, but we have uh, our currency is pegged to the Euro. So it never fluctuates, which is very good for, for, for our economy. The average temperature is throughout the year 25 degrees Celsius, which is amazing. 
we have we are, we are known for our uh, political and social stability and uh, <clears throat> uh, okay, recently achieved the graduation into middle income country group uh, we have now close to 80 percent of mobile users uh, is the third african country human development index the ranks 39 in corruption perception index first in african most often countries and fourth African country in information technology and communications development. Uh, <clears throat> so as far as the economy overview, these are data prior to COVID-19, of, of course. Uh, prior to COVID-19, Cape Verde uh, showed a robust economic growth driven by a thriving tourism sector who was on the rise and strong structural reforms. Uh, between uh, 2016 and 2019, the growth averaged 4.7%, uh, supported by uh, favorable conditions globally, of course, and also internal structural reforms. On the demand side, it was driven by net exports and private investments and consumption. On supply side, growth was driven by tourism activities mainly and domestic non tradable services. <clears throat> also, the government had uh, implemented uh, several privatization efforts to uh, that help support investor and consumer confidence. The sustainable robust economic growth led to a decline in poverty of the population from 20.4, 24.5% in 2015 to 11.5% in 2019. <clears throat> so as to development strategies carried out by uh, Cape Verdean government, <clears throat> first place in the private sector as a growth engine only that only through that you can attract more more investment uh since uh Cape Verde is a small market uh, <clears throat> the country wants to position itself uh, as a hub for service and transport between Europe and West West Africa leveraging his uh its uh, great location also, uh, since uh, due to our proximity to the west coast of Africa region, the country was to turn towards that region in order to seek market opportunities and increase trade volumes. <clears throat> the diversification of the economy, economy is uh, indispensable because uh, currently Cape Verde is uh, <clears throat> uh, highly focused on tourism and with COVID-19 that uh, uh, made a huge impact on our economy. Uh, <clears throat> digital transformation of the economy, as uh, I, I, I showed in the previous slides, we have uh, a high internet and mobile uh, penetration in, in, in our population. <clears throat> the government want to do, want to do structural reforms such as the improvement of local production, goods at, of goods and service, creation of a system of certification of quality and, of the local products and improve the transportation uh, system. As to the business opportunities, there are several business opportunities, but uh, I can list a, a few here. Uh, light industry, fishery products, salt, food, utilities, water and energy, construction, fisheries, agriculture, namely coffee, wine, flowers and fruit, service industry, uh, mainly information technology, telecommunications, and transport infrastructure. So uh, the government has a, 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 a project uh, implement, implemented a project uh, with several uh, state owned companies that will be um, privatized in the next few years. So that include airlines, airports, port management and shipyards. And of course, we have also opportunities in the agribusiness uh, industry. <clears throat> As to incentives, so KVR provides several incentives to investors. Uh, as far as tax benefits on stamp duty and financing operations, import tax for investment purposes, real estate tax in acquiring properties for investment purposes, that vary between islands. The islands with less uh, resources, the investor will have more tax benefits. That's to, in, the, to provide more incentives to invest in those islands who, who are, who, which are still, uh, they don't have uh, that much of investment. Uh, reduced income tax rate for non-residents. Uh, also, there are tax benefits for the newly uh, established uh, green car holders 
which is uh, a, basically an investor visa. So you can uh, be a resident and also uh, enjoy some tax benefits as a result. Uh, Non-discrimination, fair and equal treatment of investors, security and protections of good and rights, ability to transfer funds in foreign currency, free open and transfer from foreign currency uh, uh, bank accounts, and also ability to recruit foreign personnel. <clears throat> Here I list a few reasons that I uh, I think uh, there are reasons to invest in Cabo Verde, but there are you know uh, several more. So, of course, stable political and social environment, okay, where the country is very well known for high potential for tourism se sector diversification. So right now we are focusing mainly on all inclusive tourism, but the country has potential to do much more. The uh, country wants to be a hub for service and transfer between Europe and West Africa, as I said. So as a central economy in the middle of the Atlantic, an economy based on movement of people, goods, information, and provision of IT and logistic services. Uh, there's a huge opportunity with the emergence of new, new industries and service and the long-term development based on sustainable alternative to the tourism, of course, such as blue economy, IT, private, uh, public and private partnerships, agro business, and of course, renewable energy. The country wants to also to position itself as a digital hub capable of supporting business outsourcing and back office uh, operations, software development and cloud hosting. As to cloud host, hosting, there's uh, a major par project that is under um, Constructions that will, you know, uh, host uh, most of the service to provide this kind, this kind of service to to other countries. So uh, basically, uh, in you know, we have a very short time, but uh, this is uh, this is a few um, uh, quick uh, informations about uh, Keyword and uh, reasons to invest and doing business there. Uh, I'm available to provide any clarifications. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sergio, also for your uh, presentation. Uh, very clear. I heard a lot of uh, opportunities for, uh, among other such investors. Uh, you mentioned blue economy, all, um, I would say, subjects that are very high on the agenda uh, within the EU, also in the Netherlands. Uh, digital hub supporting uh, businesses, uh, ICT, agriculture, tourism, construction, fishery. So uh, one of the things that I also liked about your presentation that you mentioned is that um, the more you yeah, uh, focus on the, let's say, least developed islands, the more tax benefits. So I believe that's a way also to try to uh, develop the whole country and not only certain, uh, certain islands. Um, so and the incentives were also very clear coming from the, from the government. So um, yeah, thank you for uh, enlightening us uh, on, uh, on this subject. Yeah, um, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, we will continue with the last presentation, which is from Mr. Alvin Leondas. Thank you, Alvin, for being present. I know you are traveling at the moment and that you still find time to, to join us. So he's a co-founder and executive director of FOMS International, and he will share experience about doing business in, uh, in Angola. So the floor is yours, Alvin. Yeah, thank you very much. I uh, hope you can hear me well. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to, to produce and provide some information. Um, first of all, hello, bedankt. Hola, obrigado. Hello, thanks. And thanks for inviting me to this webinar. I would like to show you gladly, uh, as I call a great story or a fantastic story of what I did in Africa and more specifically in Angola. So here you see the city of Luanda. It's, it's maybe interesting for everyone to have a bit of view of what has been developed here. Not everything is perfect. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. It's not a perfect world we're living in and Africa is no different. But there's been a lot of involvement and, and progress of new buildings. So just a little bit about myself. I, I'm Dutch and I started going to 
to, to Africa in, back in 2000. So I moved from the Netherlands going to South Africa. And around end of 2002, I went to Angola. So Angola is not your first location you would go to, but I managed to get a very interesting job at the company called Now Dutch. This is a freight forwarding industry. And then later I went for the company, which is a freight forwarding industry, an international global company called Kuhn and Nagel. And in my last about 10 years ago, I was working for DHL for West Africa. So West Africa was involved from Senegal all the way to Angola, looking after cargo and freight forwarding. So in total, I worked in about 12 different African countries. So I do like to say I have a little bit of Africa experience. And back in 2015, we had a, we had a mission or we had a plan. My business partner, who at that time was the CEO for DHL, we had the plan to set up our own business. And we would like to start a freight forwarding company in Angola. So this is where FAMS was born. And FAMS, you can say a lot of items, but what it stands for, we like to say it stands for freight and management solutions. So we were connected with our background, as you can understand, Kuna Nagel, as well as DHL. And we were requested to become an agent for big international entities. And we also had the plan to go for expansion in all sorts of different business areas, but also different places. Now here on the, on the right side, you see a couple of images. It's not taken from the internet. I took them myself. And it gives you a little bit an idea of the beauty of Angola. So what, why would you start a business in, in Angola? And SOPs, we don't, we don't say it stands for Standard Operating Procedures. We always focus with our business on safety, as well as schooling and all the services that are available in the country. And one of an important service, for sure, is the health. And the O stands for opportunities. Opportunities, there is a lot of opportunities in Africa, but I always like to say to everyone, there's a similar amount of obstacles. As we heard from Jaco in this, in this presentation, there's all sorts of small, let's say minor issues that can become a big, big problem to continue your business. And besides that, you also have to check what is, what is the opposition doing? And there I mean, of course, your competition. So competition is different in Africa. There is less competition if you compare it to, for instance, the Western world of, let's say, the Netherlands. And the last P, this is more our internal part of, of our company. Of course, we, we have to focus on profits, otherwise you cannot survive. But also, FAMS likes to focus on their people, which is both internal, our staff, and our clients. And besides that, we always strive for progression. So progression is the part to grow, to innovate, and to come up with something new that is not yet available in the market. So what did we do? What did we set up? And here is a small overview of our, our FAMS group. We started with, in, back in 2015, as the agent of DSV. So this, this is FAMS Angola. FAMS Angola is, was basically focused on freight forwarding. So freight forwarding was always our main industry. And that's also, as you understand, my background. And we set up an international company, an offshore, as it's so-called, and which helped us to, to use the US dollars that we would get from our international clients. And that gave us some ground to stand on. And back in 2018, we went to Mauritius. And there we set up, or we took over another company, which was already active in the freight forwarding industry. And from Mauritius, we also handle all the Indian Ocean Islands. One of the biggest one is for sure Madagascar. And this is where we handle a lot of cargo, which is freight coming in and also going out. Then back in 2019, you see, you see the image here below. 
in 2019, we took over the DSV office from Zimbabwe, uh, which was a very big organization. It had more than 65 staff and we had very little time to take it over. But I can gladly say now that it was a huge success. And here you see our office with warehouse and we have uh, at the moment more than 50 staff still working there. Besides that, we, we had an interest in other areas. So back in 2020, we were approached by Aramex, which is a courier company, and we set up FAMS Express. I will gladly show you more in the, in the next coming slide. And lastly, last year, we extended up to Malawi, which is a new area. Um, it is connected, let's say, to our business. So this is where we are. Where at the moment, we're quite small, but we hope to be bigger in the coming future. At the moment, we have more than 100 staff, 100 FAMS employees. We have more than 40 vehicles driving all around. Besides that, we, we rent our trucks and we get space on uh, the ocean freight vessels as well as air freight cargo. We have more than 11 offices and also warehouses or a combination of the both. So what is it exactly what we do? We are a freight forwarder and that's basically as I like to call an architect of transport. We assist companies of import and export their cargo. As we say, business to business. This is the main activity of freight forwarding and everything that comes around it is called the management part, which is customs clearance and delivery. Besides that, we can offer warehouse and handle of the, of the goods, taking them to the final destination. And besides that, we do domestic, let's say road freight and cross-border transportation. Here you see a couple of slides of what we handled. Uh, the lower part is a, a vessel where we handled the biggest projects in Mauritius, which were trams, uh, a small connection of cities are now connected on the small island of Mauritius with a tram connection. Back in 2020, as I explained, we also went for a courier business. So the courier is a, is a completely different industry. It's small, personal shipments. And as we say, this is business to customers. A, a courier normally handles up to let's say five or 10 kilos. And we handle the customs formalities and we deliver up to the front door. This is quite special because we, we offer this for anywhere within the Angolan frontiers. Lately, we are setting up a new activity, which is a virtual address for Angolan nationals to purchase any sort of item that they like to buy from overseas, let's say from Amazon, Alibaba, or uh, any similar account online where you want to purchase your, your cargo and you cannot get it delivered to Angola. This is a new service, as you can see, that we're promoting, and that's called Shop and Ship. Now, we don't have so much time, but it's always a little bit exciting to explain what we do and where we connect together. So we are connected to the company called DSV. And DSV, for who doesn't know it, is one of the biggest global freight forwarders. They purchased UTI, they purchased Panopina, and lately they purchased Agility. Um, for the ones that know it, these are very big brands, big names. And at the moment, DSV has more than 55 staff, and they're based from Denmark. They're active in more than 80 countries, and they have slightly more offices than I have, because they have 1,400 all over the world. More information you can always find on the website. And here you also see the other activities we have with RMX. RMX is an international courier company based in Dubai, as you see there on the top. And they handle, I'm, I'm not sure how many million shipments, but they have more than 18,000 staff and seven in, active in 70 countries. Here on the images, you see a couple of items, and this was the first delivery that that we did, which was delivered by my team for myself. So making a small conclusion, if you want to start in Africa, my tip would be to start small. 
don't start too big. Don't try to do everything, but be present. You have to be here if you want to make it a success. And I would highly recommend to work together. Don't think you can make it by yourself. There's a lot of constraints. There's a lot of difficulties. And working together with different companies will for sure assist your success factor. Besides that, it's important that you have a passion. You, you need to have a passion and you have to show your passion. If you don't want to be here, you're probably more successful elsewhere. And as I said, opportunities are here. There's more opportunities in my point of view than in, in a European world. But there's a similar amount of constraints. So just accept that. And if you, if you think that your product really has a very interesting market here in Africa, then I'm sure you can, you can succeed. Besides that, which is a general part, focus on your numbers. Angola is not an easy place. It's not a cheap place. It used to be one of the most expensive cities for expats. So always keep a very strong focus on your numbers. Lastly, if you have a niche market that you think is very interesting, you can always reach out to me. Business ideas are always welcome. I can assist you and maybe we can even work together one day in either FAMS or RMX. And please keep my contact details on your file. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin, for this uh, very good presentation. Um, yeah, like I, I really liked the, the, the practicality of the, um, yeah, of the tips that you that you gave today, uh, specifically in terms of, yeah, follow your passion. You can you really hear that what you are doing is really your passion. You have grown so fast from my, uh, from, yeah, from what you presented, but I think it's because of your expertise. You really know what you're talking about and you understand well the needs of the clients and potential clients and link that knowledge. So very, very good. I, uh, I really get excited from this type of presentation. So um, yeah, thank you very much that you were, uh, yeah, that you've uh, um, shared your experience uh, with us. So Big uh, yeah, we now have uh, had all the presentations uh, of today. Uh, there is uh, some time a little bit shorter than I was hoping for Q&A. And I see there are already a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Uh, I was just going to read some. Um, I think the first one was, um, just give me a moment. Uh, let me see, Guna has sent me one. Um, let me open the chat, the Q&A chat. It's from Alex uh, Matozu. Uh, it's for Sergio, and he says Cap Verde is also interesting as the biggest diaspora outside of Portugal, which is based in Rotterdam. I grew up in Rotterdam, originally from Guinea Bissau, but I know the Palo people from uh, Cap Verde, and that's indeed um, uh, the Palo people in, uh, in Rotterdam. So that's indeed there's a big diaspora of uh, yeah of Cap Verdeans in um, in Rotterdam. So are there any bridges to this important community, Sergio? Oh, he's typing an answer. <laughs> but perhaps you could also answer the question. Uh, uh, no. no, I can't hear Sergio anymore. Sergio, are you there? No. I think we lost Sergio. Oh. Okay, because Alex also had another question. Okay, then for all. But I, I think I think I can in a way also uh, help uh, Nuria. Oh yeah, since, Omar Lisa, we, indeed. Since yeah. we do have a, a, a strong contact with uh, Cape Verde. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, we invite also or we supported an invitation of of Sergio and. Uh, we know very well uh, the country, and as you say, has one of the strongest diasporas uh, in Rotterdam. And we have members of our team uh, also working with the community, the local community. So we are focusing in this bridge as uh, we speak. Uh, it's one of our main goals for 2022. Mm -hmm. So hopefully more uh, good news will come ahead. 
Hello. Uh, I, I was just having trouble uh, with, the, with the microphone. So Alex, that's a great question. Not only in, in the Netherlands, but I think the whole uh, Benelux area has a, uh, a, a significant uh, Cape Verde community. And I also hope this webinar can contribute to start the conversation and strengthen that bridge between the Netherlands and, uh, and Cape Verde through also the Cape Verde diaspora uh, to invest in their country, but also to bring more Dutch tourists and uh, uh, investors, of course, because there's a lot of uh, proximity. There's, thank you for your question. Uh, thank you, Sergio. Uh, Alex also has a, another question for Alvin. He's saying, why not uh, setting up an office in Mozambique? Uh, it's a very good question. <laughs> we, ha we are connected, as I explained, to DSV. And DSV is rather big in Mozambique. So we're already working very closely together with Mozambique. We handle all the cargo for going in from uh, uh, for Zimbabwe as well as Malawi, it goes via Baira. And we're gonna be visiting there soon, but uh, we do work together with uh, DSV at the moment. Oh, okay, this way, yeah. Um, thank you for answering the question. Uh, I do have another question for uh, Armindo. Um, somebody saying, is it possible to share a list of well-established processing companies that are exporting already? So, <clears throat> and if you want to answer that, or perhaps yeah. uh, the person who sent the question can directly connect to you via email or phone. Yeah, I think that will be, uh, also thank you for the question, first of all, and also Alvin, thank you for representing so in such a, also inspiring in a way yeah. the, the Angolan business case. I think uh, very good also to hear it again. But just to replying to that that question, I think yeah, the best way uh, just send me an email directly. Of course, we are more than willing to assist uh, in providing some context, uh, may, maybe specify a little bit more the question. What I forgot also, and if somebody has more interest in, in some some sectors we mentioned as opportunities, of course the embassy. I think I also can speak for my colleague in Mozambique. We also have available. Uh, uh, market intelligence studies uh, so to RVO. We have some studies available. Uh, fruit for, uh, with regards to fruit, I saw some potato person or companies all, also in, in the list. We are actually now at the moment doing a potato value chain development study. So also, okay. if you need some more study information, please give us an, uh, an email, send us an email. And with regards to the question of, of a list of processing companies, yeah, send me an email with a little bit more specification and we are more than willing to help and to, to send you the information available. Okay, thank you, Armindo. Um, and then we have a question for Alvin. Somebody saying, uh, from Holland, I'm a real estate investor and hostel in Rwanda. I would like to get in touch with an organization that specializes in interior design, kitchen, bathroom, living space. And do I get in touch with these companies, companies that are also confidential um, of when you say to work together? So I see, I hear a lot of things from this question. And I think uh, perhaps uh, the person can also connect to our middle about this because the person is probably looking for business linkages and or uh, Alvin or Armindo could definitely help in there. I don't know yeah. if you want to add something. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there's two good questions. I mean, um, how to connect? I think that's the, that's the first one. And how to trust? I mean, those two topics is very essential in, in general, right? And speci especially in Africa. So uh, to connect, there's all sorts of options. Uh, I would recommend uh, the Dutch Embassy. I have a very good connection with them. I can really highly recommend that. And besides, there's all sorts of fairs where, where you can see what is happening. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is always best if you're going to do business in Angola to be in Angola and to visit Angola. Um, if you're going to do it remotely, there's going to be more challenges and more difficulties trust-wise. Uh, how you can uh, find companies. I mean, there's all sorts of options. It's, it's specific what you, what you need exactly. Interior design is going a bit too far for me. But if you need... So some sort of uh, normal kitchen or items, I can uh, I can connect you if you need. Besides that, uh, how can you trust? I mean, um, 
that that's always that's 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 more complicated. I would say if you don't if you don't have your legal entity in Angola, if you don't have it, let's say out of your your normal area, you have to find a way that you're still going to stay in your comfort zone. And there, I would say work together with a freight forwarder. Check if they can support you because if you're going to send your container, let's say with hundred thousand dollar of cargoes, you need to have someone on the other side here in the final destination that will make make you comfortable that we don't just give the documentation and that the, that the client can run away without payment. So I would highly recommend to, to check, to work with a freight forwarder that you like, that you trust, that you know. Uh, of course, I'm one of them. And um, see what, what are the options for yourself doing business in, in Luanda. Yeah. So good luck and you have my contact. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, and then we'll go to into the last question to Sergio. Um, somebody is asking, what did you meant by non-discrimination of investors in during your presentation? Or perhaps Marisa? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, I meant uh, non-discrimination in general. So oh. that includes investors. Yeah. So, uh, so the, the country, the institutions do not discriminate whether the investment comes from a specific uh, area of the world or the amount of the investment. So every investment is welcome and is treated uh, in the same way. So basically oh, okay. what I meant. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sergio. So it's 15:26. Uh, um, yeah, we will close the Q and A at this moment, and now we'll close up uh, the the webinar. Uh, thank you all for the attention, and I hope that this um, seminar give you a little bit of knowledge about the Lusophone Africa, but also inspire you perhaps to re do more research about uh, the three countries and maybe even one day do some um, yeah, trades or direct investments in, uh, in those countries. Uh, if you need anything, you can also reach out to uh, the Netherlands African Business Council, the NABC, and uh, specifically the country experts. So for Angola, I'm the one uh, representing uh, Angola within uh, the NABC. And you also have the direct contacts of all the presenters of today and we will share the presentation and this has been recorded and we also share it among you. Uh, just to draw uh, one last thing, uh, to draw your attention, uh, least but, uh, last but not least, um, there will be the first uh, EU Angola Business Forum taking place in Brussels on the 24th uh, of March of this year. It's actually a kickoff um, of series of public-private dialogues around Angola's economic reform agenda uh, to support the private sector investments uh, in the country. But before that date, feel also free to tap in next uh, Monday, the 14th of February, uh, to join the discussion uh, during the 7th EU Africa Business um, Forum where also the Angolan opportunities for European investors will be presented. Uh, Mr. Amindo uh, Tanes will also be present during this, um, this forum and will also take part of this discussion. So thank you very much for your attention today. Um, if you need anything, just uh, yeah, please reach out. You have our contacts. And I hope it was, um, yeah, like I said before, it was inspiring uh, for you and feel always free to reach out. Thank you very much. And also to the presenters and the people that participated uh, or, uh, today. Thank you very much. <laughs>